All right, hello. Today, this video, we're going to look at another sorting method. In the last video, you heard about selection sort. And if you remember what selection sort did, because we're going to come back to that a little bit later today. Um, selection sort, we're trying to sort objects from smallest to largest. In selection sort, the algorithm or the steps we came up with, the computer goes through the array and selects the smallest object and swaps it with the current one. So at every spot, it had to look through every element in the array to find the smallest one. Once it figured out who the smallest was, it switched it with the current spot. And once we got all the way through the array, we ended up with a sorted list. Okay, so today we're going to talk about one called insertion sorts. So that's what you can call these notes. Insertion sort. And selection sort, I told you the next program that you do is going to be all about um, writing these sorting programs, set up sorting algorithms. And I gave you all the code you needed for selection sort. There was public void, void selection sort, and then there is a two helper methods, public void um, find smallest and public void swap. Search and sort is also going to have that or something similar to it. So first off, what you want to think of with insertion sort, the major steps, it looks for a smaller element. then inserts the current element in the correct space. Hopefully by now you've figured out that you need your own paper for notes today. Um, but that's why it's called insertion sort. It's inserting it where it should go, essentially. So that's kind of like the quick overview of what it should be. Um, let me write out more specifically what's going on. So it's going to be a little long, so bear with me. So the array has two parts. a sorted list and an unsorted list. The computer looks for the correct place to insert the current object. And the way it does that, it shifts everything to the right to make room. So, and shifts everything to the right. To make room. And that's important. It can't be swapping because swapping is a selection sort. Insertion sort is a shift, not a swap. Okay. And lastly, it finds the correct spot. By searching for something smaller. or if there is nothing smaller, or the start of the array. Oops, getting ahead of myself here. Searching for something 
smaller or the start of the array. Okay, so that might sound a little confusing at first glance here, but hopefully it'll make more sense in a second. So again, there's two parts. We're saying this section of it's been sorted. So the, between here and here is low to high. And then there's some unsorted pieces that need to be sorted. So the computer takes the next thing that should be placed in the correct spot. It looks backwards through the sorted part, looking for are you smaller, are you smaller, are you smaller. Once it finds a smaller element, it knows, okay, so if you're smaller, this current object has to go right next to you. So it kind of saves that current spot, shifts everything down, and inserts it where it needs to go. If it never finds anything smaller, that means it should go at the start of that sorted part of the array, so the beginning of the array. So it still saves it, but it shifts everything that's been sorted so far down and then inserts it at the beginning. All right, so your old pal wanted to come back and help you one more time. Here's Carol. So remember, while I'm going through this, I'm going to be saying some things that hopefully will help you because your goal in this next program that you're going to write pretty much after you watch this video is to write the code for insertion sort. And it's similar to selection sort. You want to follow that same outline, but the steps are a little bit different. So follow the steps that I'm trying to show you here and think about how you'd make that into code. So I have to start somewhere. So initially I'll say, okay, zero, he's sorted. We got to find where these other guys go. Okay, so the first guy I'm looking at is number one. So my current spot is one. And think about it, just like selection sort, I've got to go through the whole array. So I've got to start here and go all the way to the end of the array. So obviously think about what you're going to need in the first method, what type of loop. Okay, and then there's two helper methods. First method is to find position. I've got to find where he goes. And I do that by starting at this spot in the array right to the left of him and working to the beginning of the array. Now when I is one, there's only one person to check. And he's saying, are you smaller than me? And the answer is no. So if he gets all the way to the front and never finds somewhere smaller, then the position he should go is space zero. So that find position method should have returned zero. So now I know he should go in zero. So my second helper method is called shift. I need to go from the current spot, shift everything down until I get to zero. So what shift does is it saves the current spot. So there's some variable saving that, maybe some temp variable. And then from the current spot down to the one I'm trying to shift into, the current spot has to equal the one before it. So one equals zero, which means one equals that now. Now once I get to zero, I've gotten to the spot where he needs to go. So I take that temp variable and I set spot zero equal to the temp. And now, that's not the sorted part of the array. Now, this is the sorted part of the array. And now I is two. Okay, so same thing happens. I start here and I work backwards through the array. This is fine position again. And he says, are you smaller than me? And the answer is yes. So that means he has to go one to the left of this spot, which is where he is, space two. And then what shift does is essentially nothing. It saves space two still but it goes from space two down to space two, which means it does nothing. And when it gets there, it inserts that copy right back to where it needs to go. So now I've gone through the loop twice. So now this is my sorted section. This is unsorted. Okay, so here's three. Now I'm at three. So here's find position again. I'm gonna start at two, working backwards down to zero. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? No. I reach the front. What happens in find position if I reach all the way through the loop and never find anyone smaller? That means he goes at the start. So find position returns zero. And then shift saves the current space. It goes from the current space down to zero. And it sets current space equal to one before it. Current space equal to one before it. Current space equal to one before it. That's how the shift happens. And then when I get to the space that he's supposed to go, it doesn't shift anything into there. Instead, it takes the saved value and puts him in there. So that shifting stops when I get to the space I need to move to. Okay, so there is your first 
0 through 3 now. And it continues on like that. So it's going to say, are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? Yes. So find position. Where does he go? He goes in position 2. So the first one smaller, the position that's returned is the one directly to the right of that. Okay. Now shift. Save the current element. Go from the current spot down to the one I'm going to, which is 2. Current spot equals the one before it. Current spot equals the one before it. That's repetitive code, so that has to be in some sort of loop. A loop running from the current spot to the one I'm going into. That loop stops when I get to the one I'm going into, and I insert my saved variable into there. And now you can see 0 through 4 are in the correct order. Okay, so I'll go a little bit quicker, but are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? Yes. He goes in space 3. Save current space. Current equals 1 before. Current equals 1 before. Up, oh, I'm where he needs to go, so don't shift. Instead, set the current space equal to this guy I saved. Last couple. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? Yes. So he goes in space 4. Save the current guy. 6 equals 5. 5 equals 4. 4 shouldn't shift. 4 inserts. And you can hopefully see that as I go through this, it's definitely going to work. Everything that's up through 6 is now sorted. Uh oh, 7 looks pretty tiny. He's going to look for someone smaller than him. But no matter where he goes, no one's smaller than him. So he gets all the way through, never finds a smaller guy. So the position he goes in is 0. So here's shift. Save him. From 7 down to 0, current space equals the one before. Current space equals the one before. 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 All the way down. Once I get to 0, I insert. Now, only got two guys left. Looking for 8. Where's 8 going to go? Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? No. Are you smaller? Yes. So he goes to space 6. Save him. Go from 8 to 6. Current equals 1 before. Current equals 1 before. Once we're at 6, we insert. And you can probably see where we're going here. Last guy through. We look at 9. 9 says, are you smaller? Yes. So we save 9. Shift goes from 9 to 9, so nothing happens. And he gets inserted. And we have our sorted list. Dunzo. All right. Stop now, and if you have any questions on how this just happened, let me know. But I hope we went through enough of them that you kind of start to have some ideas of how to write the code. Let's do a number example. So now that you've seen it with carols, let's do it with numbers. Because remember, on this test that comes up eventually, you're going to have to figure out how many different shifts happen and whatnot. So here's a number example. Let's do 5... 3, 2, 6, 1, and 4. So initially, we'll say 5 is sorted. So the first pass through, it's going to say, where should 3 go? Is 3 less than 5? Nope. We're at the start of the array. So what happens? Save 3. 5 shifts down. So this is 5 now. 3 gets inserted. Those are sorted. 2, 6, 4, 1 weren't even touched. Second time through, we're looking for where 2 goes. Not smaller, not smaller, so 2 goes at the beginning as well. So 5 is going to shift down. 3 is going to shift down. 2 has been saved, and now I can put that where it goes at the beginning. 6, 1, 4, never been touched. Third time through. Looking for where 6 goes. Is 5 smaller? Yup. So nothing really needs to happen. 6 stays where it is. 5, 3, and 2 didn't shift at all. 1 and 4 weren't touched, so it looks like nothing happened, but now I know that 6 is in the right spot. Fourth time through, is 6 smaller than 1? No. Is 5 smaller than 1? No. Is 3 smaller than 1? No. Is 2 smaller than 1? No. So where does 1 go? At the start. So save 1, shift 6 down, 
Shift five down, shift three down, shift two down, insert one where it should go. And all that's left is to figure out where four goes. Okay, last time through. Six smaller than four? No. Is five smaller than four? No. Is three smaller than four? Yup. So save four. Six shifts down. Five shifts down. Three doesn't move. Four is inserted. And three, two, one stay the same. And we've got our list. So there's what the list would look like after one pass through two, three, four, and five. All right. Questions. All right, just pull me over if you need me. It's kind of a tricky topic, so don't feel bad if you have a question. All right, let's talk code. I said we're not going to talk too much. For the code, you're going to write. And that's kind of the purpose of the next program. You're going to write up selection sort, so you're going to copy just exactly what we wrote in the last notes. But you are going to write, oops, I wrote problem. Really want, meant to say program. But you're going to write the code for this. And you'll make a hierarchy chart first. And for my hints, and I'll detail a little bit better in the next program. Remember, we got two helper methods. We're going to have find position, where it finds where the current element needs to go by looking for something smaller. And it's going to have shift, which is not a swap. I'm even going to make a note here. For shift, no swapping. You have to save the current element and then move everything down. Okay, so in your next video after this, you'll get a little bit more specifics on what that program's going to look like, but hopefully that'll help a little bit. But there is one more topic in this one, and this is kind of a tricky topic as well. Because now we've got two different methods for... Um, organizing arrays and both of them work both of them will work every single time so what's the point of having more than one well there's actually more than two as well there's other ones that we're not talking about you might mention some in AP comp side but even then we don't talk about all of them some of these can be more efficient than others in certain situations and how we measure measure efficiency is with something called big O notation could start a new page for this. So I should say notation. And it looks kind of like function notation, but don't think of it. Big O notation is always O of something. So this is kind of thinking about the number of things to sort. And what it is, it's an estimation of the efficiency of an algorithm. So when you talk about efficiency, what do you think would make something more efficient? One of the things that people usually think of first is time, how long something takes to do something. That's usually what we talk about when we're talking about being efficient, doing something quickly. The problem with using time, what would be the problem with using time in a computer? Well, if you've got Aunt Ethel's 400-year-old computer, it's going to take a lot longer than your state-of-the-art, super quick computer that you just got for your last birthday. So that's the problem with time. It's not consistent. from computer to computer. And that could be because of processors, memory, etc., whatever. So what big o, o notation takes into account and what's a better method for efficiency in computer science is to think about how much work it actually does. 
So how many operations needs to happen? How many operations does it do? When I say operations, I'm usually talking about comparisons, how many times loops have to run, things like that. So how many operations does it do? And the other thing is computers aren't really, they're all pretty much the same efficiency if I just have to sort five or 10 elements, even a hundred, it's not a big deal. All we really care about is really big numbers. So if I want to sort a million things, a billion things, when we're doing big O notation, think in terms of really big numbers. That's where computers start slowing down. It's not five or 10 things. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little comparison of selection sort and insertion sort. And we're gonna come up with a way to decide which one is more efficient, if you have some ideas already. So let's do selection sort first, That's what we did yesterday, or in the last video, whenever you watched that. So I'm gonna kind of split the screen in half here, and I'm gonna do insertion sort on the other side eventually, so leave yourself some room. But with selection sort, We'll use the same list for both. We'll do two, three, five, one, four. So remember what selection sort did. We want to think about how many comparisons are being made and how many swaps are being made because we're looking for the lowest and then we're swapping. So leave yourself some room. There's going to be four lines here. One, two, three, four. And as I go, we're going to count the number of comparisons. And the number of swaps. Okay. So initially I'm looking what goes in that spot. So I have to compare to find the smallest. So I'm going to say initially two is the smallest. Is three smaller? No. Is five smaller? No. Is one smaller? Yes. So now one's the smallest. Is four smaller? No. So if you counted with me, I made four comparisons there. And I'm making one swap. One's going to go here, two's going to go there, three, five, and four stayed the same. So I made one, four comparisons, one swap. Okay, next time through, looking where it goes here. So initially I'm saying three is the smallest. So count the number of comparisons. Is five smaller? No. Is two smaller? Yes. So that's the smallest now. Is four smaller? No. So I just made three comparisons that time. And I'm going to make one swap again. Two with three. Everything else stayed the same. All right, third time through. I'm looking what goes here. I'm saying five is the smallest. Count the number of comparisons. Is three smaller? Yes. So three is the smallest now. Is four smaller? No. So I just made two comparisons. How many swaps? One again. Three and five are swapping. One, two, and four stayed the same. Then my last time through, I want to know what's there. How many comparisons am I going to have to make? Just one. Got to look between four and five. And four is obviously smaller. And how many swaps? Also just one. So we swap four and five, three, two, and one stayed where it was. Okay, so that's when, let me say at the top here, if I say n equals five, you know what I'm referring to? The number of elements. So I had five elements. When n equals five, I had to go one plus two plus three plus four for my comparisons, and 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 for my number of swaps. What if n was n? How many comparisons would I have? When n was 5, I had 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. If n was 10, it'd be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9. If n was just n, it'd be 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n minus 1. And then how many swaps were there? Well, there were four when n was five. 
it was 10, there'd be nine. If there was a hundred, how many would there be? 99. So if there was N, how many would there be? N minus one. So that's in general, how many comparisons and swaps I'm gonna have to make. Now, this part is where it might get a little weird for you. All of you in Algebra 2, I hope at this point, have had sequences and series. This isn't super important for computer science, but just believe me when I say 1 plus 2 plus 3, that's called an arithmetic series. Because 1, 2, 3, 4, it's an arithmetic sequence. It goes up by 1 every time. It goes up by the same amount. There is a formula to find the sum of the first however many terms of an arithmetic series. And this is where it doesn't matter if you believe me or not. Using that formula, I would get that this first section here is equal to n times n minus 1, all divided by 2. Now that is true whether you believe it or not. It comes from the arithmetic series formula from Algebra 2. Plus another n minus 1. That's this guy over here. Okay. Well, what's this really? This is n squared minus n all over 2, so over 2, over 2, plus n minus 1. If I were to graph this, what type of graph is this? It's n squared, so it's a quadratic. So really, this is a parabola, and we're thinking for really big numbers. For really big numbers, this is the driving force. That's what makes it quadratic. That's what makes it a parabola. So we say that this has about O n squared. It's a quadratic. That's essentially what we're saying. So this has efficiency O n squared for really big numbers. And this is the same whether it's the best case scenario. Best case scenario means it was already sorted. I still had this check everything and swap with itself. Average case scenario where it's somewhat sorted but somewhat mixed up. Or worst case scenario. Worst case scenario was it's sorted, but it's sorted exactly backwards from how I want it to be sorted. Regardless of the case, it takes the same amount of um, comparisons and swaps. Okay, so that's the efficiency for selection sort. If you've got any questions, if something didn't make sense, pause it, bring me over so that I can answer it, because insertion sorts happens next here. Good? All right. Now let's go back to compare it to insertion sort. We use the same initial array. So n is 5. 2, 3, 5, 1, 4. And just like last time, we're going to have four passes to get it sorted. And just like last time, we're still going to have to compare to figure out who's smaller. So number of comparisons. And number of shifts. Okay. So initially we said two was sorted. So... The first time through, how many comparisons do I have to make? We'll have to say, are you smaller? No. I'm at the start of the list. So I only have to make one comparison. Technically, I don't have to shift at all, but think worst case scenario. How many, what's the most number of shifts I would have to do? Well, at most, if this was like one, I'd have to do one shift and then insert them. So we'll say at most, there'd be one shift here. In our case, there weren't any, though. Second time through, how many comparisons do I make? Well, in my example, just one. I look for one comparison and I find someone smaller, so I know that he needs to go to the right of him. So in my case, there's no comparison. There's only one comparison again. But worst case scenario, if this was a one, how many comparisons would you have to make? Two. So at most, you'll have to make two comparisons. And if you had to make two comparisons, how many shifts would you need? Well, if this went in the beginning, you'd make two shifts also. Again, in my case, I only had to make one comparison, and I needed no shifts again. Okay, third time through, how many comparisons? 
yeah, this is worst case scenario. I got to make three. And since this is worst case scenario, I have to shift once, twice, three times before I insert. So three comparisons, three shifts. And then the last time through, again, in my case, I only have to make one, two comparisons before I find someone smaller. But worst case scenario, we'd have to make one, two, three, four comparisons. And worst scenario, I'd need four shifts as well. In my case, only one shift and two comparisons. All right, but look at what just happened. Essentially, I had the same thing happening twice. So we would have 1 plus 2 plus 3. When n was 5, we stopped at 4. So if n was n, I'd stop at n minus 1. And then I'd add that all over again. Or I could just multiply it by 2 since it happens twice. Just like before, this section in here, I could write the sum of the arithmetic series. It's n times n minus 1 over 2. Mathematically, those two expressions are equal. 2's cancel. I'm left with n times n minus 1, or n squared minus n. And for really big numbers, what type of graph is that going to be? Well, n squared's the driving force again. So this also has no n squared efficiency. However, when I was doing these counts, I said something. What was I always considering when I was making these counts up here? I was saying if it was worst case scenario. So if it's worst case scenario, it's O n squared. And essentially, even if it's average case scenario, so if it's somewhat sorted, also a little bit unsorted, it would also end up being a quadratic n squared amount of moves to make. But that's only in the worst and the average case. What if it's already sorted? What if it's the best case? This is the last part here. What if, oops, getting ahead of myself again. I just get so excited with notes. What if, best case scenario? Best case just means, again, that's already sorted. How many comparisons would there be every time? Well, think about it. If it's already sorted, you make one comparison every time to find someone smaller. So if there were five values, you'd compare once, compare once, compare once, compare once, total of four. So there would be one comparison every time. One comparison every time, and how many shifts? No shifts. I always find that he's in the right spot. I don't have to shift at all. So for five elements, I just had four comparisons. So for n elements, I would have how many comparisons? n minus 1. Right? Five elements, 4. 10 elements, 9. 100 elements, 99. n elements, n minus 1. And no shifts. So what type of graph would that be if you plugged it into your calculator? Well, for really big numbers, n is the driving force. It's a linear graph. So in best case scenario, insertion sort has O of n efficiency. So what does that mean? Well, that means that after all that work, insertion sorts is better efficient efficiency. It's slightly more efficient, but not by much. In most cases, selection and insertion are each as good as the other. But in that best case scenario, insertion sort does have a B. All right, what do you think? That was a lot, I know. It's one of the, probably one of the trickiest days in CompSci 2. But hopefully you have a good idea about big O notation and how insertion sort works. In the next video, we'll, 
I'll show you a quick graphic comparing selection and insertion sort one more time. Maybe it'll make it a little bit easier to understand this big O stuff. And then we'll get into what the next program is really going to be like and what I'm going to ask you to do with that. Okay? All right, that's it for now. See you next time.